a little pop-up where you have to agree to stay in the meeting to um, yeah keep going. So welcome back, everyone. Um, recording is on. Um, and looking at the notes, uh, people are, are writing their check-in, which is nice. Hope everyone had a good summer break and is now back uh, in maybe offices where uh, if you're where you're based already enjoying like autumn and conference season has started. So that was my update uh, that it's like suddenly got very, very busy again. Um, so welcome to our first uh, um, drop-in session. We have a guest speaker in uh, in a bit, which is Sana Isabel Ulfsparev from Umeå University. And I hope I didn't butcher that too much. My uh, Swedish classes have been a while and I've not been practiced, but you can correct me in a bit, um, uh, Sana. Um, before that, um, just a few updates from uh, us uh, at DMP Online, um, what we've been up to over the summer. In terms of events, I already mentioned that like we've slightly reworked how the drop-ins um, are running. Um, we, we now have a shared agenda that you've uh, known from the demo sessions already. Um, where you can we can help us get the notes right for these meetings. Um, we've extended the the meeting length of these um, sessions because they've been in the in the calendar for thirty minutes, and most cases we've overrun, especially if we had like really interesting speakers and good discussions afterwards. Um, so we've now made, blocked them for for sixty minutes and uh, take time back um, if that if we don't need the full hour, um, but at least they're now in for the whole hour. Um, we have a good lineup of speakers uh, already going forward. So Magdalena has uh, nicely chased some volunteers to um, report uh, going forward. And um, if we don't have um, speakers will um, basically use this, these sessions to discuss um, new features, new developments, and dig into some of the things that we've started discussing at the at the user group in June uh, in a bit more detail. Um, yeah, Magdalena has put a, a whole block together uh, around what we plan um, in terms of the events um, for the next period, and that's based on the survey feedback that we've um, got from you and we've asked from you over the, um, the summer. Um, we also have uh, on uh, that note, another survey open um, um, to get an understanding what you would like to see in terms of training. We haven't run a training session in quite a while, but we also weren't entirely sure if that was uh, needed. Um, so we are asking you um, if you want us to um, see uh, more training sessions run and what you want them to be about to make sure that we actually deliver something that's useful um, to you. And um, the um, other note is that um, we are um, like based on the actually nice, really nice um, user group session in in June, we're planning to um, do them more regularly and um, have one penciled in for November. I'm not sure if Magdalena has announced that already uh, and, uh, to, to all of you, but yeah, there's another one of these um, coming as well. Um, in terms of uh, what we've been working on as the team, um, over the summer, we've done a, a bit of these backlog talks, tasks, um, reviewing a few things. One of the things is going through um, some of our static pages and see where they need um, updating and where, um, yeah, where we can improve them. And um, when that will happen, we'll decide uh, next, next month. So we have, uh, we, as a team do like regular um, quarterly calls where we try to, to plan out um, the, the work for the next period. 
And one of them is, is coming up where we basically catch up uh, now that everyone is, is back in the, uh, in the office um, and plan that. In terms of what has, uh, has happened to the systems, uh, we've done some um, updates and, uh, and there are like relevant blog posts out there. Um, not that much is visible. A lot of it was like fixing uh, infrastructure uh, in the back end. Um, and uh, yeah, we are now back to, to looking at the list of um, issues and bug reports that you sent in. One that is like freshly fixed um, this morning is that finally April 2021 stats are back in your dashboard. So they've been missing for quite a while, not entirely sure um, um, uh, why that has happened, but they are now back, that's been fixed. Uh, in terms of team updates there, um, we haven't managed to grow our team yet. So we're still waiting for um, the university to put out uh, the two more um, job openings for additional software developers. Um, we'll let you know once they are out so you can help promote. Um, if you want to, if, if you know someone who would be interested to, to joining the DCC in general, the job that we have out at the moment is um, an events manager that, that's actually also su supporting uh, in parts of the DMP online team with sessions like uh, this and the user groups and everything we run. And um, then we've also worked uh, over the summer with our colleagues in uh, at the California Digital Library, uh, taking all the feedback on versioning that you've given us a user group writing that up in, uh, in a way that makes sense and discussing that uh, with, with them to make sure that it fits their needs and it fits your needs. Um, and that is shaping up nicely and uh, hopefully something that we can um, get to you in a blog post or a little presentation at, uh, at the next drop-in session. And yeah, last question is basically just the, the regular call for you to for feedback, anything you would like um, like us to see um, to, to adapt our session. We are always open for suggestions and uh, we'll uh, do our best to um, accommodate these. I'll pop the link to the shared notes where all the stuff that I've just talked through is written down as well for anyone who has um, just joined in the last few minutes to um, give that a look and contribute to the, to the notes. And if there are no immediate questions from you to my update, and there is a bit more time at the end. If, yeah, Mark. Yeah, I had a question about the contributor uh, uh, role. Uh, a problem. Uh, I received an email that would, would have been fixed yesterday, but uh, I checked yesterday and today and I haven't seen the solution yet. Is that uh, correct? Um, remind me again the, the exact fit. So I know what we fixed is that if you add folks, um, you, you can now add um, the, the um, institution affiliation um, lookup is back. That's um, the well, I, I, uh, what I uh, meant was, I'm not sure if it's the same thing, but if you're creating a DMB mm -hmm. and um, you want to, uh, depending on the type of DMB you select, and that has to do with either uh, there's a funder or uh, uh, it's affiliated uh, with your institute or not, uh, depending on the choices you uh, make before creating the actual DMP screen, and then you get to the screen where you start your DMP. Um, the, the tab with the contributor uh, options um, does not allow anything except uh, your own university or other, or if uh, you chose the right options before creating the plan, uh, you can select uh, options, uh, affiliates, but then it's a fixed list, which is already there in DMP online. And if you choose something that's not in the list, it's not accepted. 
Oh, right. Okay. So like, yeah, what definitely the, the predefined list is back of institutions. Um, and for anything that's not in the list, you would need to pick other. So yeah, that's right. Um, basically, that's because uh, previously uh, we had that as a free text field and that's where a lot of like uh, duplicate institutions came in because basically people started typing something then didn't pick the right institution from the drop down and entered a slightly varied version of actually institutions that we have already. Mm -hmm. um, and then they were available as an op option in the database. And then when new people basically um, joined DMP online, they weren't sure which one to pick, picked the wrong one. And that means they didn't actually get all your institutional offers. They didn't get your like customized templates um, and uh, uh, anything there. So yes, we have a predefined list in, uh, of organizations in DMP online that now is back. If you add contributors that you can select from, uh, if it's not on the list at the moment, the best option is other. If you have um, institutions that you regularly um, work with that you say like they would be really neat to be an option in the predefined list let us know and we can add them to the predefined list we just don't want to open open it up again for everyone to enter things because last time that caused a lot of issues and we spent mm -hmm. a lot of time cleaning it up <laughs> and merging uh, uh, right. merging institutions I, I, I understand uh, only the uh, other option is kind of suboptimal <laughs> because a lot of our researchers work with uh, second or third parties and they're regularly not in the list. So a free text field would be uh, convenient even if uh, it's in, in addition to the other option. For instance, yeah. you can select other if it's another institution not in the list, but add a field where you can indicate what the other is. Uh yeah, that makes sense. I'll I'll put that on. Um, I'll, I'll make a note. I'm not entirely sure how we best implement that mm -hmm. to make sure we keep on top of yeah. uh, the, the, the suggestions yeah. and feeding that into the predefined list. Yeah, the alternative I should usually uh, suggest is uh, well, uh, the free text fields within the DMP itself. Uh, you can of course uh, type in anything you want there. So it's uh, it's not a big thing in the sense that it's a field that's being used in the actual DMP, but it's kind of an inconvenience. <laughs> Noted. Um, we'll, we'll see what we can do without introducing something that, again, causes uh, causes issues uh, um, as, as it has done in the past. It's, it, it looks quite quite trivial if you fill it, um, but apparently, but really has like messed with the system quite a bit. Um, but yeah. That's noted. And if there are no other comments on um, anything that we've worked, any fixes uh, um, that I have seen, and feel free to continue putting those in the in the notes, and we can pick that up uh, at the end. Um, I would now hand over to our uh, guest speaker, um, which is um, Sana from Umo University. Um, a note uh, ahead of time that like we would like this to be an, um, an a discussion and um, a, a sharing of experiences so while Sana is uh, speaking if you if there's uh, something that resonates with you um, challenges that uh, similar challenges that you faced um, uh, would be really nice if you would share them um, at, at the end and we get a little bit of a experience exchange there um, again if you don't want to um, uh, do that uh, verbally at the end and unmute yourself, um, feel free to take the time and type it in, in the shared notes or in the chat and um, I will pick that up on behalf of you. But yeah, um, our guest speaker is Sana Isabel Ulfsbader, who works as a researcher, support librarian at Umeå, Umeå University in Sweden, very north. Um, Part. I, I hope it's beautiful there. I guess it's beautiful there. I've never been that far north. Um, she's amongst uh, other things specialized in web communication regarding research data management. And today um, she's here to speak on the challenges of communicating researcher support um, as the language for doing so is very much under development. 
um, especially in environments where English isn't the only language of communication. So that's going to be interesting how to translate all these beautiful things into your local resources. Um, Sana, if you're happy to go, um, feel free to share your screen and take it from here and I will shut up. Yes, thank you. And also thank you for the presentation. You got my name right. <laughs> Let's see now. Here we go. Do you get the correct view now? Now it's back speaker? to the speaker view for some reason. Um, it was perfect in the trial. Here. Maybe if I do maybe if I do it like this. Better? Yeah, now it's the uh, um the PowerPoint on starting on page two, I think. So that's but that looks okay. good. Yep. I'm back. Wonderful. Yeah, there we go. Yes, uh, like like Patricia said, I'm uh, interested in um, exchange of experiences. This coming presentation is basically me having back engineered my experiences of working with <laughs> research data communication um, and the challenges, uh, some of the challenges we faced and also a uh, lot of focus on what's actually made it work. Uh, and that's also kind of my starting point. I'm more interested in what works than be in being right. So I'm very interested in hearing your feedback later. Um, I'm going to talk about RDM communication using a vocabulary that is under development. Uh, I have noticed that often in these discussions, there is uh, there are these um, ideals that we fall back on. Um, some of us want a controlled language, and some of us uh, are more interested in, in maybe an organic language. And I'm going to go, and I hope I'm going to be able to explain what I put into those words during this presentation. Um, Basically, controlled language is uh, things like controlled vocabularies and thesauri. And we often use them for metadata because they are predictable, just like your fixed list of institutions. Um, they are very good for organizing information and making it uh, possible to group. While organic vocabularies are the kind of uh, or organic language is the kind of language we use every day when we talk to each other. It's kind of messy and full of synonyms and overlaps in meaning. Uh, and when operating in a field that is as much under development and holds many uncertainties, such as research data management, um, it can we can tend to turn towards controlled language in order to find maybe a sense of stability. Organic language can seem a bit unpredictable. Um, but personally, I prefer the organic language approach when it's not a matter of met metadata. And I hope that it will become clear why during this presentation. And I also hope that I'll be able to offer a perspective of an empowered path to RDM communications where we are not as reliant on external uh, confirmation of our language, but we can find a path forward ourselves. And I have, uh, I'm also going to present at the end a bit more practical example approach and three questions that I have found it constructed to be able to lean on when working with writing researcher support communication. Uh, it is also helpful when writing uh, information for interfaces such as the implement line, I think. The reason that I'm a bit hesitant to go for the controlled language uh, angle is that I have found this 
to be a common pattern where we wait for an authorized vocabulary and control definitions to uh, be delivered from an external source. And during the time that we wait for these uh, definitions to, to come, we can't uh, actually communicate. We can't, we can't provide the service to our researchers since we don't have the language for it. So, but it, and it also, besides not giving our researchers the support they need, it also results in uh, prolonging the period where the vocabulary stays undefined as there is a lack of use. So we can't see how the words are used in practice. And this delays the process of definitions and understanding meaning, which in turn, makes us wait longer for authorized vocabulary and controlled definitions as it is difficult to develop, develop a language isolated from its context. Um, so I have seen there is a risk for stagnation if this loop becomes too prevalent. It is okay if one environment does this, waits and sees how this language will develop in other places, but if it becomes what the majority does, uh, the whole field stagnates. It, it becomes very introverted. Uh, instead, I have found that a good enough approach enable communication language growth. Uh, of course, there is risk, the risk of making mistakes, but as long as you are prepared to note and change and edit, that is not such a big deal. Um, and that process of good enough for me has been something like this. Uh, you start with making an educated analysis when encountering a word uh, or a term that you don't really know what it means. Uh, you start to articulate definitions by looking at other contexts where it's used. Many of the words in research data management come from other fields. Uh, of an academic field, so research. Lots of them are related to uh, information technology uh, fields and uh, library and information fields, archive fields. It's a very cross-disciplinary field <laughs> in itself, research data management. So, so uh, there is often strings to pull to find definitions. Uh, and then once having done that research and made an educated analysis to use these words in spite of the uncertainty that still remains when you can't benchmark and you can't look at what others are doing. Uh, the next step is to listen and observe and any reactions to, to the, the communications you put out there, compare notes with others, uh, start to think about whether where you use are synonyms with with the close lying words or if there are different meanings and basically execute a balanced and uh, positive self-criticism because this sort of uh, after publishing <laughs> analysis uh, leads to some sort of insight into did this work or didn't it do i need to revise or uh, Am I satisfied? So I can just put this down as a growth, uh, growth uh, uh, point in the in my vocabulary uh, surrounding RDM. And if you are satisfied with the results, uh, make sure to keep the door open because new information around the vocabulary might arise. Uh, there is always an ongoing conversation about meaning. Uh, even in fields that are more stable, uh, there, there is always, always this uh, organic movement when it comes to meaning. And you might find that you get the impression, you, you, you gather impressions other, from other places that might lead to a more efficient way of communicating. So for, stay in the com conversation, be, be, be prepared to edit in the future. And remember that growth equals change. As the field change, the language will change. Change Communication is never done, even if uh, the content you produced is so-called static. Uh, 
a living organic language is always under development and it's free to be in, in that state as well. But isn't a control vocabulary more precise? As a librarian, I have a few insights <laughs> from working with library catalogs and controlled vocabularies. A control system might look neat, but it does not mirror the mess of reality. Uh, there will always be resources that don't fit the system and thus risk being hidden or misrepresented in a too tightly controlled system. A controlled and closed hierarchical, sy hi hierarchical system is not flexible for future changes and developments. Uh, some of our <coughs> uh, library, like the Dewey system, it, it uh, or originated over 100 years ago. There's been a lot of uh, technical and social developments since then who, that has been like pushed into the system after the fact in, with various results. Um, and also words, words change meaning over time uh, because the contents of a field change meaning over time. And a very tightly controlled system doesn't really give space for that. So controlled vocabularies and systems are great for generalizing and grouping resources and making them possible to find and identify in both. But for precise and in-depth communications, a more flexible way of approach might be preferable. Um, So I have uh, <laughs> learned by doing that there are three steps toward making a word useful in a new field or the three questions that I mentioned earlier. You find out what is the origin of the world and what is the origin of its field? What are the values active there and how is it used and what does it point to? Then. How have the word and its field developed since then? I'm going to give you an example of this later. And also, since we are talking research data management and open science, where the field is so much under development, what needs to develop? What might this word need to contain in the future? And I'm going to give you three examples. Archives. Everybody knows the name. Okay not necessarily the contents of what an archive is in a formal sense, but uh, everybody has heard archive, repository. I call it the comeback kid because it's, it's <laughs> I'm sure you'll notice why. And also interoperable, the new kid in Swedish. First, archive. To many, an archive is like a storage room filled with boxes and curiosities, or maybe like the, the option in Word where you uh, can, the fold down option in Word where you, where you can save your document. Uh, so many people feel like they know archive, but it turns out that no, uh, archive is not a storage room filled with boxes and curiosities. That is unsurprisingly storage. Um, an arch archive is not only a place, it's also a field. It's a highly qualified area of expertise and it's regulated by law. So please do not define or use this word without researching it or speaking to an archivist first, at least not when offering research support, support and external information resources. Uh, also, archives have two legs. It's about handling and organizing public documents and records for the future so that we can hold our institutions accountable. And also, of course, with the research, research data that we can use data again. But it also is an element of storage and it's a very regulated storage. And currently, at least in Sweden, the storage bit of archives are based on physical documents, documents and their legal and their needs. Um, we are lacking in policies and guidelines for safe digital archives. So in this, this is the case where the answer 
to the what's the future of the world question is that it's very likely that this uh, will develop and change due to digital demands and that we need to be aware and take care of this uh, during the transitional period when we communicate around archives. We both need to bear in mind that people think they know what an archive is, but also to uh, compensate for, for this gap between the physical uh, materials that, is, that has been the norm and the digital demands that is, that is very prominently arising with research data management uh, needs. Then we have the Convec Kid, the repository. A repository used to be like a bookshelf and a list of what the bookshelf contained. It is also a word for contain, container of intangible knowledge and wisdom, like a book is a repository of uh, knowledge and wisdom. And it's also a word for someone uh, entrusted with something important. That is the origin of this word. And I rather like it because it's, it, the feel to it still rings true to me. But more currently, uh, we talk about software repositories. When we, start, when we stop talking about repositories in the general sense, I guess libraries kind of took place of the word. Um, software repositories where it was reborn or a repo. And a software repository, as far as I've seen, is about storage, metadata, and managed resource. Uh, and it's managed both by humans and mechanically or technically. And so when we look at this word repository, uh, what consequences does it have for high quality research data management? What do we need to add to the word repository to make sure that the storage is safe, for example, or similar issues? Uh, since storage is a huge issue, that is for sure what comes to mind first. Uh, and with a more solid digital orientation to the archive word, I would uh, have loved to be able to write archive level repository uh, just to catch the meaning of that, that uh, care that archivists put into the... <laughs> The preservation of, of their um, collections. But since uh, the focus is still so much on the physical media, that's, that's, I think it's some time away to, uh, before I feel comfortable doing that. And then we have the new kid in Sweden, interoperable. We didn't have a Swedish translation. Uh, so we made a loop around compatible. Um, we had compatible, uh, but are they really the same? And it turns out that no. If you go to the origin, that is the information technology field, they are not the same. Uh, compatible, it's two different things that work together. Why interoperable is more of a fluent, they are closer. They're more, it's more of a fluent system. They are part of the same system almost. Um, it's all about how machines relate to each other and there is nuance in that. So we needed to find a word in Swedish for interoperable. And we uh, tried some versions, interoperativ, interoperabel. And here is where the power of synonyms comes in. It can be both, it's not a controlled vocabulary. We can accept that it's both. It that is the freedom of the organic language because uh, we can sit the two, two different seats of learning, one deciding to use interoper interoperative and the other deciding to use interoperable. And it's okay, as long as we are clear about what we mean with the word. Uh, our researchers are bright people. They will understand that we're talking about the same thing as long as we make it clear. And I like to finish with interoperable because I think it's such a beautiful metaphor for RDM 
and uh, basically the development scenario that we are seeing right now. Um, with the origin of the word, we're talking about machine interoperability, like fair, it's very machine oriented, but interoperability, uh, we can also talk about legislative interoperability. Our national laws need to uh, function with European laws, for example, in order for our research to be, uh, to be interoperable and able to flow within Europe. We can talk about infrastructure interoperability, where we help each other and make sure that our researcher support follows the same lines so that a researcher who changes seat of learning does not need to be confused because it seems like we're talking about different things. We can make sure to, to, uh, uh, talk, to have the same language, similar have discussions about how our, our IT environments and online environments work so that people always feel at home in their infrastructures, regardless of where they come from. And we can try to find communication interoperability where we learn from each other because doing that will, in time, get a very strong communication uh, within our fields. We can talk about national and global interoperability um, and find a common mental picture for our common goal, thus strengthening this idea of research as a no nation enterprise. So that was my reflections on uh, the, the language aspects of research data management. Uh, I was aiming for good enough. I hope I shared it. And these are my contact information and uh, also our web resource if someone wants to see it in practice. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. I have, like, I've done a little bit of linguistics ages ago and um, um, but then like, yeah, you don't really think about it um, uh, that, that much if it's like not your, your focus work, but it is really, uh, really, really interesting insights. Um, and I'm slightly surprised that Swedish didn't have a, a word for interoperable, but- uh, uh, We had it, but I think it was so fringe. Uh, so it wasn't in any dictionaries. It was such a specialized right. word. Yeah. Compatibility seemed to have more of a spread. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's really interesting. I, um, I, um, have like similar like uh, issues that like it, I only worked in research data management really in, in English in my jobs, but um, well, still German is my my mother tongue. And every once in a while, you think like, oh, I should be able to do this in German, and you realize that like. No, I'm just like lacking all the specialist vocabulary. <laughs> and, uh, you know, German is this wonderful language where you can create really long words. And then you're like trying to put the, all the English ones together and like try to figure out which long German one word sounds like the right one that's capturing mm -hmm. them. <laughs> uh, just to then figure out in conversations with colleagues in Germany that like, oh, yeah, that one we don't actually translate um, that one we it's just more you know more common we just use the English one in German and you're like well <laughs> yeah but that's okay too that's borrowing words it's yeah. so, like, so so it's just this uh, we I think that we need to be flexible and kind to ourselves and keep focused on actually communicating rather than communicating perfectly yeah um, so there, like people are typing in the document, so um, which is uh, really interesting to see. Um, so I guess if someone wants to actually um, say something, feel free to raise hands or unmute. And uh, if not, I'll just pick up points from the from the document. Um, Thomas, if you want to, yeah. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation, uh, Sana Isabel. Um, I think if, if we um, work with research data support, we always have um, 
to think of two different worlds. On the one hand, we have the human world, um, and then we have the world of the computers. And um, if it comes to language, these worlds are completely different. Computers can use controlled vocabularies, but the human brain, um, I would say it does not need it because the way our brain works with all these incredible many neurons that are connected with even more synapses that are constantly changing, we are able uh, actually to relate different meanings uh, in different situations to the same words, which computer can't. So um, sure, it's always uh, important to be concise and to think about whom we are talking to. Uh, so an analysis of the, the target groups we, we write for and we talk to is very important. But um, yeah, for humans, it's perfectly okay if language is, as you say, good enough, <laughs> precisely, uh, precise enough. So yeah, I think this was a really, really very nice uh, presentation with valuable uh, thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Rory, do you want to go next? Yes, hi, thanks. Yeah, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. That was really, really thought provoking. Uh, I, for my, for what it's worth, I completely share your, um, your hesitation about controlled vocabulary. So we're on the same page. So when, when, when you started out talking about communication, I kind of assumed that the focus of your talk was something which is often comes up with research data managers is effective communication with researchers. Have, having seen what you said, it seems like this was more focused on development of language and communication within the RDM community. Um, although obviously it also relates to researchers. So, uh, and I think the examples you picked were also really interesting. Another one which I think is quite relevant is uh, data, even, even in the same language, data or data, uh, but anyway, data or data versus metadata or metadata. Uh, and that means very different things to different people. And I wonder if, if you could comment a little bit on how you have extended these insights that you have, which I think are, are great, into communicating with, uh, with researchers and how you would recommend that others do that. Yes, let's see if I can. It was several questions, right? Uh, so let's see if, if, if I can answer them all. Uh, I think that the language discussion is most active within the support community. Uh, because we are the ones who are concerned about how we are going to communicate these things to our researchers. And I have been most active in writing researcher support on the web. And I've been trying to do that also with a mind to uh, all of the different kinds of research that is uh, uh, produced within our seat of learning, because we are what's the word in English? We are a wide range university. We, we ha don't have, a, we aren't specialized uh, towards a specific academic field. So we have to cover uh, researcher information from humanities to STEM, to teaching, teacher, uh, ped pedagogy it's called, and uh, arts. I mean, it's a very wide, uh, field of communication when you write for the web. So data can mean a lot of things <laughs> in our seat of learning. And it is a challenge uh, both for us to communicate and for our researchers sometimes to understand if what they are handling is considered data uh, or if it is something else. And actually, since I have Thomas here, Maybe I can uh, can uh, get some help with answering these questions since Thomas is the person who has been teaching most at our seat of learning. Uh, so you might may, might have some insights from your side of the operations. Mm, thank you, Sana Isabel. Well, um, I. 
oh, we already talked about uh, that um, knowing your the people you talk to your your target group is very important and uh, we can develop some kind of intuition for that yeah sense how how do we have to do that um yeah i i can't say anything better it's uh, sensing what is right to do in a certain situation uh, um how to talk to 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 the people uh, you can do some preparation for it that is important and the rest has to be done on site. Um, I'm sorry, that is a very unprecise answer. <sighs> but it's also a very user-oriented answer. Uh, and it's two different kinds of communication because you often talk to a specialized target group while when I write on the web, I have to try to include all <laughs> the target groups and uh, it's two different challenges. Um, I oh, think yes. Um, yes, it is definitely. Um, yeah. Um. Yeah, thank you for both of your answers. That's, yeah, I think that's also a really interesting point about the differences of communicating verbally in person and on the web. And so thank you. That was, yeah, thanks. Yeah, very good points, Mark. Uh, you have your hand raised if you want to come in. Yeah, uh, I put a question, uh, two questions in the uh, word form, uh, the uh, notes of this uh, meeting. Um, it boils down to basically um, my origins are uh, the library. And in the last couple of decades, we've seen a, a big digitization process. And uh, of course, uh, a lot more overlap between uh, digital information uh, and how it uh, affects uh, the use of information or data in different sciences, as well as the findability using different metadata methods, uh, metadata or term terminologies. So in a way, I think uh, it could be an advantage to have uh, gone through that process and have a bit of knowledge uh, on uh, what it entails, how to connect data, how to exchange data, how to exchange metadata, and also to explain it in different fields. That's uh, what I find when I advise people from different fields of science on uh, what uh, to do with their data and how to handle it. I'm not sure if everybody else feels the same, but I think it's a little bit of an advantage if you have that type of background, maybe. Um, does, does it uh, help for others as well that they have either an IT background or maybe a library background in the function of dealing with uh, data management issues? My question. <clears throat> I think uh, I should leave the floor open so that someone else has the chance to answer first, if you like. Um, I have a, can you hear me? Yes, yep. we can hear you, Beth. I have a, an issue with, I've come from a library background, I was a cataloger, and we're, we're just the same as, as researchers, we tend to assume that people know what we mean when we say things, and um, often we're, we're using quite what we think is quite precise language and it turns out that other people aren't using it the same so i think um when we when we come from both an it background and a uh, a, a library background we really have to challenge our assumptions about our own language all the time but i think you know when you when you talk in person to people the language that you use is negotiated anyway so <clears throat> Um, but you, you need to make sure that you're listening so that you know that that, that, that really is an, a negotiation rather than rather than you're assuming what people what that people are understanding what you say. Very much agree. Hashtag me too. Um, I did put a note in the in the 
in the in the notes document as well. I'm very anxious about about uh, language being about definitions being being hijacked. I mean, it, we've seen it with open access with the publishers, um, but we think we've defined a, a term and something that we would think was not um, ambiguous at all, like you know, it's all um, date of acceptance. You know, suddenly we get we get messages back from authors, but the the, the publisher has told us that that means something completely different. Um, uh, and I think <clears throat> what I'm what I'm doing more and more is rather than talking about publication date, where I think everybody knows that it's what it means, uh, but is open to definition and interpretation. I'm saying, you know, the date you could first read it, um, and the same authors accepted manuscript and saying that, you know, it's a document that has got peer review, um, uh, that, that has peer review changes on it. Um, because or, or, whenever you give something a name, somebody will, somebody will, will hijack that name or debate it. Yes. Yeah, that I mean, is. It's, sorry, it's a sorry. good point. Um, uh, um, and we, can, I guess uh, that's where the, um, you know, the research data community can potentially learn from what has gone wrong yeah. in, in the open access area and try not to, to repeat some of these. It's so much earlier in the process and things like um, when it, it's a, a bit of an arms battle between the funders and the publishers with us in between. And if the funders say that your data needs to be in a repository, and then the publisher says, oh, put it in our place, we'll call it a repository. And then we really have to say, what do we mean by repository? And that will not be a place in a name. It will be processes. So it will be things like curated pres preservation standards, um, uh, standards for content, um, uh, standards for for um, for identifiers, rather than just saying we'll put it in a repository because you can, you know, particularly if there's money involved, you can call anything you like a repository. And so we really need. To I I have found actually that literature studies taught me the best line of defense here, that they imprinted on us that our toolbox was the language. Yeah. And they imprinted on us that it was highly important always to define, to provide the mm -hmm. definition so that the reader could understand what we meant when we used the yeah. word uh, sub subsequently in the text. Yeah. And I think that by doing that and especially considering that we are uh, often trusted authorities, um, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, libraries and similar institutions are often carry a high amount of trust. We yeah. can uh, uh, yeah. stand our ground against that sort of uh, misuse. I'm really interested in a language that hasn't got a word into our bubble because actually it's kind of about that trust because we're using that word as if it's got a very definite meaning. But when you look at a, a language that hasn't got that word and you have to think about what it means, it only it doesn't mean anything without context. If you don't say what you what you mean by that word, it really doesn't, you know, it's interoperable with what? You know, what are they what are the mechanisms? By which you, you know, so it's it's a it is a generalisation, and we're using it. Um, I, I mean, it needs to be unfair, but we we can't use it um, at any in any context more precise, but more defined than that, um, less general than that, without defining exactly what we mean. Yeah, Diana, do you want to go next? And then Mark has another point. And we've we've already made this longer, and we're still like managing to to go past the hour. But it is a really interesting discussion. So if folks are happy to stay on, I, I'm happy to keep this going. 
um, very naive questions, perhaps. I don't know how much uh, natural language processing uh, technology is being used in re research data management. Do you use things like machine translation, um, text summarization, keyword extraction? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious how much you work with um, data scientists in this, with computational linguists. It's a naive question because I don't know genuinely. I don't know uh, research data, the world of research data management that well. I confess. So the key. The key the question for who? For, for who is the question? Uh, okay. Well, I saw a lot of developments in the, uh, in computational linguistics uh, is a grow a very rapidly growing field, especially with adding uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So mm -hmm. uh, researchers keep finding more uses and uh, use cases for doing research using those techniques. So it's, it's, it keeps growing and it makes it difficult because uh, the concepts and what they're trying to do, uh, you have to sometimes help translate uh, the concept of data management uh, in ways that they understand what they need to do. For instance, um, they're used to thinking in terms of terminology, maybe metadata and using those uh, key items in the techniques that they're using, but using them when it comes to leaving behind the research data is a different uh, animal. So some of the researchers seem to be familiar with the concepts of what data assets are, what documentation is, what is needed to make uh, the research understandable for future research, and specifically the data set, what's in the data set. But uh, helping them think of data assets beforehand, for especially during the, the planning phase, uh, something that they need to do in the first few months if they get a grant, they need to fill in a data management plan and submit it to the grant provider. That's usually a discussion you need to kind of uh, help help the researcher with to think in concepts of what are actually data assets, what could be a data asset, what what might be interesting, what might what be needed, and uh, it becomes even more tricky, especially if certain computer languages or certain computer environments also come into play uh, in the sense that if you need to rerun this code or this program, you need a certain environment to be able to rerun it. Even 10 years from now, maybe a computer is so very different that you need maybe uh, also to uh, make a virtualization of the environment in which the software can be run. So it depends very much on what, what's needed to be able to store the data in a way that's reusable uh, in the future. I hope it answers some of your questions. I'd also like to add that when it comes to extracting meaning uh, using AI and machines and such, we use a bit of that when we catalog, catalog I think. When, when we work with a catalog, uh, with a research um, output. Uh, but I don't think that the machines, sorry, computer are bright enough yet to <laughs> differentiate in meanings. So it's more of uh, extracting a guideline and then making a human decision than uh, a complete machine process at the moment. Maybe I can add a little bit to it as well. Uh, uh, we have some people that use uh, that do a lot of text mining. And if they're using specific programs to kind of uh, uh, to determine certain concepts or terminology based on texts, they, use, they usually need to train their programs to, under, to help understand what are the key concepts and how should they interpret what they're uh, reading. And that takes sometimes a bit of time and it's kind of garbage in, garbage out. If you have a too small purpose of texts that they use to train their software, uh, then it's not very uh, learned. Let's say if you teach a kid one book 
it is not able to read too many books in the future and understand the concepts within those other books because you didn't learn, uh, teach the kids to learn different concepts that were not in the book, the first one. And also it's important to be aware that the same concept and different meanings, even in the same field of research. Uh, that was also an issue that was lifted in one of the discussions I had about AI and understanding of text. So it's not reliable, just like a dictionary might not be reliable if the word is collected from a field that is too very specific because the word has not reached that kind of spread that it has entered the dictionary. Uh, so always, it always takes the human interpreter to be able to make these decisions. And it uh, is also why it's important to, for us to engage in the language development by being brave and using it to communicate. Um, I'm actually also soon going to have to leave this meeting. <laughs> Just a heads up. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, we're running over, and uh, I, I don't know if, if no one has, here has like any major points to make. I think we can wrap up. the The notes stay available, and that uh, document will uh, stay the the note taking document also for um, any follow up um, uh, drop in sessions that we do. So if you have like other points that you didn't get to make in the session, you can put them in the notes, and um, we'll we'll you know that will stay available for. Uh, for colleagues to read and um, we'll try to um, put this together uh, in, into, into a blog post that hopefully makes sense of the discussion, but it was a, a, a really interesting talk, uh, sli slightly different from what we've had so far, but uh, definitely something that I, th I think like a, a lot of people had thoughts about and um, points to discuss. So, um, um, Sana Isabel for um, for uh, presenting to us and uh, all the colleagues that took part in the um, in the discussion. Um, I don't think there's any major notes for for uh, or no some someone um, is typing um, uh, there so uh, I'll I'll answer I'll answer that. Uh, if you finished typing uh, in the in the meantime, um, you know where to connect with us on on Twitter, on LinkedIn, all the um, notes are um, available, and I can put that in the chat as well. No, I don't have to copy it across to the chat because you can all. Uh, have access to the document and just can click on things there. I don't have to copy it across any longer. And um, the next drop-in session uh, will be on the 26th of October. Again, um, our Swedish community seems to be very active. So we've uh, managed to um, uh, convince Joachim Philipsson from Stockholm University to talk us uh, through some of the work he has done with um, the, the API, and you can see in the notes already, he has put a, a little abstract together, um, as I think he has presented that at, at um, a conference um, before. And the question uh, is, some, uh, is for examples for public plans related to humanities and law. So um, if someone has like good examples there, pop those in the documents and uh, we can make that as a, a community effort to crowdsource uh, good, good examples there um, as well. I think the DCC has a while back created lists like that, but I don't think we've updated them in quite a while. So we should do that. And um, with that, I again, thank everyone to uh, attending for attending who thought that 60 minutes wouldn't be enough for this discussion, but uh, there we go. Uh, it's been really good. So thanks everyone, um, especially Sana Isabel for presenting and see you next time. Thanks. Thank you for the opportunity.